So Google Code Jam 2020 qualification round has just ended on 5th of April 2020 and I have made this video wherein it's not necessary for you to have already participated in the Google Code Jam 2020 rounds in the sense that I have made sure that I cover each problem description in this video itself. So there has been a lot of editing work just to make this very concise and crisp wherein I also walk you through the code and solution. My name is Rachid Jain and let's start with this video. All right. So as I've mentioned, there were five questions. The first two were easy. Third was easy, medium-ish. The fourth one was the interactive one, which I really loved. And questions like these really test your problem solving abilities. And this is something which you can expect on a Google on-site interview round. And finally, the fifth one was very hard. Even red coders didn't have a very neat solution. So now what I'm going to do is basically start with the problem A, which was about matrices and it was really easy if you prefer you can pause the screen and read the description of the problem but to save your time I have basically the sample test cases that they were having so you can see there are three sample cases three inputs and for each of them we also have three outputs and what does this uh, mean like we are given a matrix and we are supposed to print the trace of that matrix the number of rows which are not valid and the number of columns which are not valid. So what do I mean by that? Let's focus on one example to understand. So this is a matrix that we are given 2, 1, 3, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3. And um, the output for that is 802. So I will bring in my boxes to make this a bit more explainable. So this 8, if you will see over here, is the sum of the diagonal elements. The main diagonal are elements are 2, 3 and 3 with sum up to 8. So that's what we call the trace. So this is the first value that we have to print. Then we have to measure the invalid rows. In this case, all rows are ex like all valid because a valid row is something which is having all numbers. Basically, it's a permutation of 1 to n. In this case, every row is having 1, 2, and 3, which makes every row valid. So there are zero invalid rows. And 2 is nothing but the number of invalid columns. As you can see, the first and third columns highlighted in blue are invalid because each of them are having duplicates and the, the first column is missing a three and the third one is missing a one. So that is why this is true and it's very straightforward. I will just walk you through the code for this. So to compute the trace, you only add the value a i j when i is double equal to j. So this means that we are iterating on the diagonal elements and we add that to trace. Now for finding the invalid rows, I'm using a utility function called count and it's very easy for you to basically write duplicate blocks of code. One is basically counting the number of invalid rows, one for columns, but I have used basically code reusability over here and I am passing a function. Uh, I, you can say a lambda function to this count. And all I'm doing is I'm iterating on a row or a column. And that's what this function is modifying the behavior with. But in the sense, what you have to do is for every row, you're using a set of integers and you iterate on that row or column and you put all the elements of that particular row and at the end you increment your count only if the size of that set is not n because if it's not n it means that there must be some duplicates and that's why the set size did not basically increase to n. Set is a data structure which holds unique values so that is why if the size is not n it means it's an invalid row or column. So once you do that we finally return. So this was about problem A, now moving on to problem B. Again, you can pause the video for the video description. And um, if you want me to explain what the problem is in short, let's say you are given a string like zero to one, or basically these are four examples. And let's say if you're talking about three, one, two, the output should be something like this. And what you have to do basically in this problem is given a string, which is something like zero to one or three, one, two, or four or two to one. So given a string, um, we have to print another string as output, wherein every digit, for example, three is surrounded by three brackets. Okay, the depth of the brackets for three in this output is three, as you can see in the highlighted section, three is basically in the depth of three brackets. If you talk about one, so we have closed two brackets after three, which means that one is exactly surrounded or one comes into the depth of one of open brackets only this first open bracket is 
having that one enclosed within itself. If you talk about two, it's basically exactly enclosed by two brackets because the because we have closed two brackets after three. So one is only enclosed by one and two is enclosed by two brackets. So this is the problem. For example, for four, you can see on the right side, just below this highlighted box, you can see that four is surrounded by four brackets. Okay. In this case, in for two to one, you can see two, both of the twos are surrounded by two brackets and one is again surrounded by one bracket. So this is what you have to fulfill given, uh, given an input string of digits for every digit, you have to ensure that it is being enclosed by as many brackets. Okay. So it's a quite greedy approach that I have taken over here and it's very easy. I have taken the input string and I am having a vector of characters as answers and the number of open brackets that I have currently is zero. Now I iterate on every character, which is a digit and to convert a character into an integer, I basically basically reduce the character zero from it. So the ASCII calculations happen over here and with the subtraction happening, I exactly have the digit in integer form. Now what I do is if the present digit is basically greater than the number of opening brackets that I have, it means that I have to open more brackets. So that's why I append opening bracket in my answer array and I increment the number of cur. Otherwise, um, I keep on doing this basically. And if the number of opening brackets is higher than the num present digit, what I do is I basically make sure that I reduce cur and how do I reduce that? I basically add more closing brackets. I have to stop saying basically so many times, sorry about that. But yeah, I do that. And finally, once I have, once I am on this line, I know that the number of opening brackets is exactly equal to X. And at that point of time, I insert C to my answer array. So this is a greedy approach. And now um, it might happen that once this for loop iteration ends, you still have few opening brackets which are left and you have to close them. Don't forget to do that. If you are wondering with a weird face what is happening, this is basically adding these brackets at the end or these and ending brackets at the end. So that's what's happening in the last while loop. So yeah, that's it. Um, now you all you have to do is just print the answer array and you will be good to go. So these two problems were really easy and talking about problem C, it was kind of easy medium. Again, the um, problem statement is in front of you, but I will try to explain what is happening over here. The question is nothing but you have n activities and in this case you are seeing that there are three activities. Every activity has a start time and end time and there are two people um, C and J. So there are two people and you have to allot the set of n activities to both of them. So basically C will be picking up some activities and J will be picking up the rest of activities. The only constraint is that each person can only do those activities which are non overlapping. So for an, for first example, you can see that the first activity is from 360 to 480. The next activity starts at 420 and ends at 540. And the last activity is from 600 to 660. So in this case, um, the first activity can be picked by C. And since the first two activities are overlapping, the second activity is bound to be picked up by J. And then the third activity can be picked by either of them. We can either give it to C or give it to J. So there will be multiple answers. And in some cases, it will be the case that it's impossible to make this allocation of activities to John and Catherine because it's too overlapping and it's not possible that they can pick up tasks in a fashion that they don't overlap. And the solution for this was a greedy one. What I do is I begin off by taking input of the n activities. I am storing their starting and ending times in X and Y. I am pushing that to a vector or a list of activities, which is known as ACT. So act dot pushback X, Y, and I. So I'm storing the starting ending times along with the index of this interval. And once I have done that, I'm sorting the activities in ascending order of start time. And this is the key over here. A lot of people, including me, actually started with sorting the list in ascending order of end time. But this is not going to work for this case. Once I have sorted in ascending order of starting time, I am trying to allocate the activities to either person C or person J. 
in terms of code the variable 2 is 0 and other is 1 so 2 is representing C and other is representing J so I'm trying to allocate an activities to 2 or other once I have that I am having this MX array of size 2 which is negative 1 because I currently do not have any activities assigned to either of them but we will see what MX is being used for now I am iterating on my activities and what I am doing is I am looking at the starting and ending times of present activity also the variable IDX is a reference to the index of this particular activity now what I am doing is essentially comparing whether the first active or the present activity can be given to person C or the first person if it's possible I make sure that the answer IDX so this is where we are using the index and that's why I was storing the reference to that so answer of this particular index basically this particular interval or this activity is being assigned to person A and I'm updating the MX value to the ending time of present activity because that's that is how far we are now Otherwise, if it's not possible to give the first activity to person A, I'm trying to allocate that to this person B. And in this case, I'm comparing that with the MX of other variable. And if it's possible, I am allocating the present activity to this other person. And I'm ensuring that I update the MX value as well. Updating the MX values are important because now we know that for each of the persons, how far they have a span of covering the activities so that the next activity has to begin after this MX okay so that is why we are updating the MX values accordingly now in the case both of the MX values are high enough which means that both allocation are failing so, so the current activity is not being allocated to either of them in that case I am marking my impossible to true and at the end of it I compare if it's impossible I say impossible otherwise for every activity in the answer array I have stored which is the person to which it belongs so this was fun and the only suggestion that I have is you have to think why other greedy solutions will fail in case you are sorting in descending order or ascending order of end time think why that is wrong so now what I want to do is quickly take a break and um, the next problem which is problem D it's quite long and um, it's quite fun the most lovable problem for me was this one I really enjoyed solving it and uh, since this video is cutting out to be too long I am planning to uh, just stop right over here and continue in the next video I do have all the slides ready it's just that I do not want to make a very long video and I think that three problems covered in one video makes sense so yeah we will see problem D in the next one everything is ready so stay tuned and I think it's good time to take a break and if you enjoyed this watch my codes and playlist the links are in the description and as I have said problem D in next video guys super good problem and this is of the difficulty which you can totally expect in Google on-site interviews and it really tests you how good a problem solver you are alright guys I hope this was fun I really hope that you had solved the first three problems if not I'm happy that you watched this video and um, I'll see you in the next one guys you can follow me on my social media the links are over here and make sure to hit the bell icon until then take care stay home and happy coding